All right, guys, I'm going to start this off. If I can ask everybody just to, to mute themselves, um, and then whenever you want to ask any questions or anything like that, just unmute yourself, stop me, and um, you know, we'll go through anything in, in any more detail. I don't want to make this a, one of these sticky sort of training things. I want it to be interactive. Um, you know, when, 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 when I ask anyone for any questions on, on simple things or things like that, just chime in and uh, ask anything that you want to do. Uh, what we're going to do on these training sessions is go over um, a number of different topics. I thought we would start off with the easiest one, which is uh, school zones. And I'm going to be showcasing a lot of the stuff that I demonstrate to prospective new buyers on why we think, you know, Glance is the best product. But also I'm going to go through some more detail in terms of how do I look at, let's say there's an issue, how do I delve into it? How do I look what the problem is and try to help the client solve the problem? Uh, and so we're going to go through about six different topics today. The first one is basic navigation of Glance. The second one is what we call level two, which is looking into level two. The third one is scheduling. So how do you schedule school beacons? The fourth one is what we call level three detailed view. What does that data mean? How do you know what it means? The fifth thing is reports. What are the reports generated and how do we look at that data? And the sixth one, which is probably one of the most important ones, is problem solving. So when we see data that doesn't look good, how do we how do we know how to look at that data that's not good? Perfect. So, so what I'm going to do is start off by um, just showing you. This is a uh, we logged into um, one of one of the first cities that uh, at least one of the first cities in Texas that. Um, that implemented school zones, and they do a pretty good job of keeping all of their school zones active. And they, what I'd call them, I was call them the one of the power users. But I did log into them this morning, and I just noticed one or two small things, and that's why I wanted to use them as a test case. Um, so the first thing that you know we we can see is everything's running on a Google Map platform over here. Uh, using Google Maps, you've got the features of Google Maps, so you can go into satellite view, you can go into map view, um, you've got street view, and you've got your list of devices on the left-hand side. What you also see is a search bar over here, which allows you to search for specific beacons or specific device IDs. And I'll get there in a second on looking at specific beacons and how I use this functionality for that. We've also got over here the number of alarms, critical alarms, high alarms, and low alarms. You can see currently they have zero alarms on their system, which is great, meaning all of their stuff is working correctly and working well. We've got a zoom button over here for Google Maps, and you'll see at the bottom right-hand side, there's a little cogwheel. This is automatically enabled when you have preemption devices, but when you have school zones, we don't automatically enable this because you don't want to clutter the map. When you click on that, it opens up a little box over here where you can show the device names, and it's going to show device names, and you can show Google traffic layers, and you can also locate specific devices. And I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail when we do the problem solving section. So my idea behind this training as well is I'm going to do about 40, try to limit myself to about 45 minutes, and then open it up for questions and things like that that we can go over. When you're navigating um, in this user interface, you can zoom on the map. We can, um, you know, zoom into a device. You can select the device, and it brings up a pop-up. 
Okay, and this pop-up is going to tell you all the relevant information on that specific device. So you can see the system voltage. That's the voltage that's getting reported back from the batteries. The monitor battery, that's our own internal battery's voltage. The solar array voltage, that's how much power the solar array is making at the moment. The cabinet door that is closed currently. And the beacon status, which is centrally scheduled, and it's currently off at the moment. The lamp status is showing OK. And the next scheduled event is the beacon is going to come on at 7.40 a.m. on Tuesday morning. Now, if you want to go into more details on this device, you click on more details. Now, you can navigate to this page from clicking on more details over there or you can go to any one of the beacons on the left hand side over here to select that same beacon so if we look at um this is well i can't find where brooks southbound is i can always just go and type it in the search bar there we go so that's the way you can navigate names of these beacons all, all the time so i can go and select uh, this is the northbound one, and you can also click previous and next to go to northbound or southbound. You can see the northbound one is an AC beacon, and the southbound one is a solar beacon. Now, I'm going to select the solar beacon to start just because... There's more interesting information on a solar one because we're looking at the way that the, the solar batteries are charging and discharging. So in this view, we can see that the, um, the beacon is online. It's currently running the normal school schedule. Its power is okay. It is, it's a solar beacon. Its time since last contact is 17 minutes and 46 seconds. This is important. And the reason that it's important is because each of these beacons checks in periodically every 30 minutes unless something is changed in the field, such as the beacon turning on or the beacon turning off or there's a power failure or there's a manual switch. So the way that the beacon works is it's, it's using push data. So it's not like most uh, traffic signal controller systems that are pooled data. In other words, they, you know, like the tactics and uh, send tracks and all those systems, they say, what's your status? And the device pushes it back. What's your status and gets it back. This is sending data whenever there's a change or whenever there's a, a 30 minute period that we periodically check in. Then you're seeing the information over here, which is the system voltage, what it currently is now, 13.4 volts, its minimum, its maximum, and its average. And this aim for the monitor battery, the solar array uh, information. And then you can see the cabinet door, and you can see the beacon status, that it's entry scheduled and off, and you can see the lamp status, which is okay. And you'll see the next scheduled events. Now, what we do is we graph everything here on the right-hand side. So you can see what the beacon status, they've had a vacation over here. You can click on any of these graphs, and you can see this is what a good solar battery looks like. It's charging nicely during the day. It's not losing much of its power overnight and charging up. And sometimes you've got um, a lot of excess power where it's fully charging the battery. And sometimes it's cloudy and it's, you know, just charging it down over here. And you can see, I presume that the weather in Texas, in Sugarland was probably pretty overcast the last two days. Just looking at the way that the battery's been charging up. Now, you can also look at the graph for the, uh, the lamp status. That's telling us if one lamp has failed or both lamps has failed or if the lamps are okay. Currently, for the last week, the lamps have all been okay. And then we can scroll down and we can look at this information, which is the solar array voltage. 
Now, this is what I was talking about. What happens is, you can see this is the solar array charging the battery. And right here in the middle of the day is, this is a, uh, a sun saver, I believe, out there, which is an open collector charger. What that means is the charger is, uh, when the battery is fully charged, it, it opens its circuit and bumps up to about 20 volts. That means the battery has been fully charged here. And similarly here, and you can see uh, on the 26th, it had fully charged the battery. It must have been a very sunny day. And over here, it fully charged the battery. And the last two days have been overcast because the solar array voltage hasn't been bumping up. In other words, it's just been trickle charging uh, the battery uh, because the solar, the solar power, you know, the sun hasn't been shining directly on the batteries. There is another type of solar charger um, that when it's fully charged, I can't remember the name of this, um, not open collector, but there's, there's another name for it, uh, that when it's fully charged, the solar array drops down to zero. And that's how you can tell that the battery is fully charged. So I can see that this solar panel is working well and the battery is working really well. What I'm going to do is, is jump into any, anyone got any questions on how to read this kind of data at the moment? I can jump into a little bit more details. Otherwise, I'll jump into scheduling um, and we'll come back to problem solving, looking at this data a little bit later. Perfect. So to go to um, setting up schedules, you click on that edit button. The first page that it opens up with is scheduling of the beacon. And you can see this is quite a funny schedule on this beacon. I didn't select this on purpose, but you can see that um, this beacon over here is running on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays at these times. And it's got a special schedule on Wednesday. Okay. So this is actually quite a complicated schedule, but I'm going to explain how it works. So you're going to have, if I double click on this, we can see that they've selected Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. They're going to turn the beacon on at 7.40. The beacon's on. And on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they're going to turn the beacon off at 8.15. Now, what they have on this beacon is an early release on a Wednesday. And they obviously don't have school on Mondays and Fridays because we don't see any tick boxes for Monday or Friday. So we can see what they've done here is on Tuesday and Thursday, they're turning the beacon on again at 2.35 and turning the beacon off at 3.20. But on Wednesdays, they turn the beacon on at 11.05 in the morning and turn it off at 11.50. So that's where you have a school that has a constant early release on a Wednesday. Now what I'm going to do is jump into some other businesses that have early releases as a, um, you know, a, as a special event day, and you'll see how to schedule that. Once you set up your main schedule, one thing I always recommend is this is under a private school. You can see it's P for private and it's Faith Lutheran, and that's why it's got one of these funny schedules. I like to name the schedule over here Faith Lutheran schedule, me personally, because when I click on that beacon, I can see that it's running Faith Lutheran schedule. It's just easier at tracking when you're clicking on the beacon that you know that it's running the correct schedule. So always recommend it to change the name. You double click on the area next to this, uh, next to this beacon. Now I'm not going to change anything because this is a live system. You just double click there, change your name, hit the tick box and hit save and publish. 
when you're publishing to two school to to a school like this, and you're changing the the normal the schedule name, what you want to do is send it to both obviously both beacons in that school. So they're both running the same schedule and the same name. We have multiple different schedules over here. So you've got normal school schedule, schedule number two, and you can see nothing's been scheduled in here. Schedule number two to 20 is designed for what we call exception schedules. When you're creating an exception schedule, it's generally for an early release day, a professional day, and there's all these weird and wacky schedules that come in with various different uh, schools and things like that. You know, some of the private schools sometimes have some funny things that go on that they linked up with a church next door and all sorts of things like that, that they want to run special schedules on different days, but specific days. So when you've got an early release that's every single Wednesday, this is the way of setting up an early release. When it's a normal a normal school, you know, you would just have Monday to Friday all selected and you would have on and off times. The next important tab is holidays and exceptions. When we select holidays and exceptions, this is where you create your holidays and exceptions. So we can see that they have their next holiday and exception is their summer break from May 14th to August 10th, 2018, which is what is already passed, obviously. And then they had Thanksgiving from the 19th to the 23rd, which is just passed. And the next one is their Christmas holidays, which is December 10th to January 7th. Now, one of the things I know some of you guys have been using the system for quite some time. Originally, these were not sorted in chronological order. That was a feature request. And now they're all sorted, you can see, in chronological order. So to change the name again here, double click in the open space. Always create a name so that when the beacons are off, you can see on that level two view that it's running the Christmas Christmas holidays. That way you can you can tell what's actually happening. And you can see here they've got their spring breaks uh, programmed in, and they've already got their summer holidays uh, programmed in for this this uh, beacon. What you can also do is if you had a exception schedule where you're running a professional day over here by standard the command is. To have the beacons off. Now you can also run it on schedule number two, which can be your exception schedule, or schedule number three or four, or whatever it is that you want to do. That allows you the flexibility to schedule whatever you want. And if you want to add something, you click on the add button and it adds another row there. Now, obviously, it's not going to save that row unless I select publish holidays, but I can select schedule number three there and it's going to run schedule number three on November the 30th. Or you can select here and you can go say, all right, we're going to make it December the 11th um, and it's going to be a two day vacation and we can have beacons off or we can run a special schedule on those two days. And then what you do is select both your beacons that you want to send it to and hit publish holidays. Obviously, I don't want to do that at the moment. Um, because I don't want to send a schedule to these beacons on a live system. Now, I'm going to get back to some more uh, comprehensive scheduling in just a second. I'm going to log out of this system and I'll log into another system. Um, you also have program delays, which is if you have a snow day and you want to cancel school for Monday. Because we are ready Friday today, you know, we don't want to go tomorrow. We want to select a date because we know it's going to be Monday. Select Monday and you want the beacons for the morning and the afternoon to be off. You hit add new. Now it creates December the 3rd. Beacons are going to be off from, you know, uh, 12, 12 a.m. to basically 12 p.m. And... If you know it's for all your schools, you just hit that button that says select all. 
Now you can hit publish and all the beacons will be off for Monday because of a snow day. Now it also gives you the option to delay the start, which is sometimes what happens is they've got the snow plows going through and the school superintendent decides to delay school start time by one hour and it's only in the morning. So we deselect the afternoon and we send that to, to all of the beacons. Or you can send it to a, a select few beacons if you want. There's another tab over here called Radar. That's for driver feedback signs and configuring them. I'm not going to go into any real detail on this. They don't have any radar set up for these schools here. And scenarios is one of the things we used to use in the beginning to turn all beacons on or all beacons off. Um, but we haven't, we don't really use that in school zones anymore. The times that we use scenarios is mainly uh, we do some snow beacons in the north where you want to turn all your beacons on with one click of a button. So what you do is you create a scenario that you turn all your beacons on or all your beacons off. And that allows you to quickly turn all your beacons on and off. What we found was when people turn their beacons on, they sometimes forget to turn them off. And that's why we brought in program delay that allows people to um, you know, turn all the beacons off for a day because of a snow day, and then they automatically go back to schedule. I'm going to log off of this and log into another system, uh, one of the Florida systems, because generally all of their um, all of their schedules are a little bit funky. So I'm going to go in, and I'm not sure which ones of these are have got funny schedules, but I'll j j jump into a couple of them and go into edit here. And you can see, here we go. They've got Bashaw Standard Schedule, which is for Bashaw Elementary. Then they've got Bashaw Elementary Early Release, and they've got Bashaw Professional Day. So if I select, when you're doing a exception schedule, the way to schedule beacons is the first thing you do is you create your standard schedule. 7.30 on, 9 off, three, uh, 2.50 on, 3.50 off. Then I select all the beacons in the school. You can either do that by selecting the heading of that school. And then I hit save and publish. What that does is it saves the schedule to the GLAN system and publishes it all to all of these beacons within the school. Then the next thing I do is I start creating early releases or professional days. So I select on schedule number two, which is the early release, 7.30 to 9 and 12.30 to 1.30. And I hit save here. I don't hit save and publish. Because if I hit save and publish, it's going to send that schedule number two as the main schedule for this beacon. And we want schedule number one to be the main, the main uh, schedule. Now it'll pop up an alert saying you're trying to send schedule number two as the main schedule if you do it, if you hit save and publish by mistake. Um, but we don't want to do that. And then you, so each time you create one of these special exception schedules, you hit save. Then what we do is we go to the holidays and exceptions. That's step number two. And this is where you create your summer break, Labor Day, professional day schedule on September the 12th. And there they selected professional day schedule. And here it's an early release schedule. Here it's a holiday and so on and so on. So you can see they've got quite an extensive list of events, holidays and exceptions for the school and that makes life uh we've got someone who is not on mute um uh, guys just please make sure you mute yourselves so that we don't hear any background noises um so this is one of those ways of and once you've set up this whole schedule 
you hit publish holidays. And what the system does is it looks at all of the exception schedules that are selected over here and it downloads these to the devices. So it will go and look at schedule number two and schedule number three and download these into the device itself so that um, it's going to run that schedule on that day. Now, everything's stored locally on the device. Remember, this is not done through the central. So once you've hit publish schedule, it's downloaded everything. If there's some kind of reason that the device doesn't connect or gets disconnected for some reason, it's still going to run that professional schedule because you've already downloaded it. When you're publishing, you'll see sometimes um, you get a little brown icon next to uh, the device, which is a schedule mismatch. Now, the times that you get schedule mismatches is sometimes someone only selects those three beacons. By mistake, they don't select that beacon, and they send the schedule to all of these beacons, but this one beacon doesn't get it. So it'll say schedule mismatch, hey, I'm running a different schedule than what you've done in the central, and you get a little brown icon. That's what that brown icon means. Now, one of the other things that happens in scheduling is sometimes to make things easier when you've got a large system like um, Harris County where they have 500 beacons. And now you want to, you know, uh, when you're setting all these schedules up, hey, all of their elementaries pretty much run the same schedule. So what you can do is you can select you can create a schedule, elementary standard schedule, for instance, and you can select all of your elementary schools. And then you can publish to just your elementary schools. There's a middle school, private school, elementary school, elementary school, elementary, elementary, middle. So you just go ahead and select all of your elementaries here and you send the schedule and what it does is it sends that same schedule to all of the beacons that are selected now it does pop up and says are you sure you want to do this um because obviously you're gonna you're gonna send a schedule across multiple different uh businesses and says do you want to do this this is the way that you can send a schedule to multiple different businesses as i call them here or multiple different schools easily then you can um, and you can send through the early releases and the you know to 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 all of these different schools as well. Um, and when you do the holidays and exceptions, it works exactly the same. You can do holidays and exceptions over to multiple different schools. I I am a fan personally of always having a name like here. You can see they've. They've, they've got the schedule over here for this beacon as able elementary schedule standard of naming the schedules like that. The reason is I would rather go through each and every single one of those schools and just change the name of the schedule because if something happens and the guys are like, they make a mistake, for instance, and they send the middle school schedule and they just call it standard schedule and they send the middle school schedule as the standard schedule to an elementary schedule and it just says standard schedule, well, there's no way to tell what schedule is in there unless you click on their school and click on edit and then look at that schedule. That's why I think for me personally, naming the schedules is a, is a nice way of you determining what schedule is running in that beacon. Um, trying to think if I've missed anything here on scheduling. All right, we'll come back to scheduling if there's something else. What we're going to look at next is the more detailed view. And what that is, is this is what we call level two of information, which is process data that you can all see. And then we get level three, which is more details about a device, and you can look at the raw data. 
Now, the times that you normally look at this data is when something goes wrong or you're trying to look at something. And what we can see over here is the raw system voltage, the monitor battery, the solar array voltage, the cabinet door status, the beacon status, the lamp status, and the lamp status for two, which is um, if you have both circuits running. What I mean by both circuits, the timer switch has got two relays on it, and sometimes you have um, just two beacons, sometimes you have three beacons or four beacons, and you want to control and monitor the, the current through each of those, then what you've got to do is, is have both of these set up. Now, what does this information mean? A one and a two and all the rest. And that's where our manuals come in. And there's obviously, you know, everybody's on the Dropbox here. You can access our manuals. And what I wanted to do is just actually go into one of these Dropboxes and show you what I mean by that. So just selecting the temple one, it's under tech docs under your Dropbox and there'll be something called glance and there's a school beacon user guide. So I'm, you know, and it looks like this and it's got a whole bunch of different chapters and I'm going to go and look at level three device details. So I'm just going to go down and scroll down to, and all, everything that I'm talking about here is in the manuals. Um, and I'm going to go down to, yeah, level three. And it explains all this data that's here, what it all means. You know, if the cabinet door shows a zero, if the door is closed and a one, if the door is open. And these are the important ones. Beacon status. Zero means it's unknown. The only time you see a zero is when you first turn on uh, the beacon and if it hasn't reported anything back. Otherwise, it's always going to show a one for scheduled off. That's centrally, centrally scheduled off. A two for centrally scheduled on. Central override off is three. Central override on is four. Local override off is five and local override on is six. So that's what those those values there mean. On level two, it obviously tells you scheduled off, scheduled on, and so on and so on. But this way, it allows you to look through the data. And over here, zero means unknown. So that's if your beacon hasn't turned on. And good is a one. And if you've got a two, it means one lamp has failed. And a three, it means Two lamps has failed. The only time you see a zero is the beacons have never turned on or the device has had a restart and is showing a zero. So if we go back to the glance system, over here we can see all the detailed data over here that at, I can look down here, at 7.15 and two seconds, the beacon was on. It went from off to on. And at 8.45, it was still on. And at 9 o'clock and one second, the beacon turned back off. And all the, lamp, the lamps are still looking good for all of these devices. So that way, you can go back and you can look at all this data. You can also select different time frames. So we can go to November the 14th and go look. What did the beacon do on November the 14th? And you hit filter. And now it's going to tell you all the data for November the 14th. And you can scroll through this and you can see the solar panel had zero volts over here and it was showing some voltage at 10 to 6, a very low voltage. And then it started, you know, it was still fine at, at 520 and so on and so on and so on. And you can go, it's got three pages of data here that you can look into all this data. We've also got error logs, which is generally for our guys to look at, and we've got uh, timestamp information. That's kind of the next level of information coming out of these devices. Um, that's a little bit on level two, which is used for fault, you know, fault finding, really. The next place that I like to look at, and I'm going to log off of this, and I'm going to log into Sugarland again. And I'm going to go look at the reports. 
And over here, you've got the report tab. Now, what I'm doing is I'm going to open up the report tab in another tab. So I'm going to say open in new tab. The reason why I like doing that is I actually like to have the screen open and the report screen open at the same time. It just allows for more navigation. Now, there's a couple of different things under reports. There's a school beacon event log, the school beacon schedule report, the beacon health report, and then what we call graph comparisons, AC voltage, beacon status, solar array voltage, solar battery voltage. Now I can open up this one, which is this, the AC voltage, and I can look at the AC voltage of all their devices, and it all looks good. Now I can go and look at the solar array voltage, and I can look for any of them that jump out. Now these look like beacons that are charging quite nicely. This one's not charging quite as well, but it still looks okay. This beacon over here doesn't look like it's charging great, but it's still staying within its 12 volt range. Um, and you can scroll through all of these different devices over here. This one looks bad. It doesn't look like it's charging very well. In other words, the battery looks quite healthy, but the solar charger doesn't really look the greatest. This is showing us that the weather wasn't the greatest on the last two days. Um, so you can look at all this data and make a comparison. And this is what's great with these graph comparisons is because you can look at what looks good and what doesn't look good. And you can see which ones jump out at you. Now, what we do as well is we look at all that data and we draw conclusions based on that data. And that's what the Beacon Health Report is. So what this does is it looks at your system voltage and it looks at your solar array voltage and whether or not everything is working as you would expect it to work. And you can see something saying fair here and something saying fair there and this one's saying bad and this one's saying bad. So let's now go and look at why that's saying bad. The battery looks great, but the solar panel doesn't look like it's charging. Now that can be one of two things. It could be that, for instance, the trees have grown over or the solar panel's not pointed at the right direction. Or if it was good beforehand, that it just generally needs to be cleaned because it's got dirty and there's a whole bunch of you know, uh, bird poo on it and, and whatever it is that's causing it not to not to work very nicely. And I can see here that this is wi winding northbound Campbell Ele uh, Elementary and it's f device 1503. So let's go look at device 1503. We go to the tab over here. Now we can type in over here 1503 and it brings up that device. Or we can look at it and it was called winding northbound. You can search for it. Um, and we can then select on the winding northbound. And what this is going to show us is the data coming back from there. There we can see our solar panel. You can see it's not, the battery doesn't look like it's discharging too badly, but it doesn't look like it's really getting charged. So then we can scroll down here and we can see that that solar array is never really making it above 12 volts. Hmm. That to me looks like the solar array doesn't look like it's not producing any voltage, just doesn't look like it's producing enough voltage, which generally means um, that it is, um, it generally means that basically you are having a a dirty solar panel would be what I would normally or all the solar panels coming to the end of its life and it's not producing as much power. But what you can also do with this is we can also then go and look at that device where it is on the map. So that's where you click on this little device over here and you say locate device. And then we're going to go look for windings northbound and then I've selected that and you hit the little arrow here and it zooms you directly into where that beacon is and we can take the little street view here 
and we can drop the man over there and we can see where this beacon is. And there it is. And it doesn't look like there's any problem with tree cover. I normally like to look at this, whether or not it's a, a tree cover problem. And when I look at it over here, it doesn't look like a tree cover problem. And this is obviously street view for the last time that the, that the uh, Google street view went across. And potentially it just needs a wipe down. So that's the kind of stuff that people can look at to say when the beat, when it's showing bad, the first step that you do is go out to that, look at your solar panel. It is connected. It is providing voltage, but it's not providing enough, which probably means it's dirty. You can, when there is tree cover, you can also look at uh, this little button over here, which is view on Google Maps. You click on that, it opens up another tab. And this is all of what you can do from here is we can see that this street view was taken December the 12th. And that is the only time that Google Street View has come across here. Okay. This must be a new neighborhood, I'm guessing. Or, but, but yeah, December the 12th, it didn't come through earlier than that. If you click on here, uh, sometimes it gives you an option of selecting multiple different um, dates that you can see what the trees have been doing over the years. But this is a great way of, of problem solving, looking at you know what, what kind of looks good and what doesn't look good. Now I'm gonna show you what a bad battery looks like. I'll log out of this system and log into a different system, um, which is, And I'm going to select on, and, and you can see whenever there's a problem with a beacon, you see the big red rings around those, uh, those beacons. That means, hey, we've got an issue. Something needs to be resolved. And it also comes up on the list here, and it shows, um, you know, we've got, we got three alarms happening on this device. And if you select this little arrow over here, it'll pop up and show you all the beacons with alarms. So we can see this one is showing system voltage low, and this one's showing system voltage low. This one's showing both lamps are out and system voltage is low. And we can go look at this one, for instance, and we can click on it. And this is what a bad battery looks like. That battery is stuffed. You can see that it's dropping all the way down to eight volts. The solar panel looks like it's charging it up during the day, but it just the battery can't hold its charge. Drops all the way down there. This is a battery that should be replaced. In, and, and I can go down to, and you can see we're also showing lamp failures for most of the times besides just when the voltage gets good and the beacon turns on. And in the afternoon, there's just enough charge that the beacon will turn on. But in the morning, the beacon's not going to come on because there's no voltage available. And you can see the solar array is still good. It's fully charging the battery over here, but the battery just can't hold its charge. So this is an easy situation where you go and say, all right, battery's bad. And the report, let me just close these tabs, the report would have showed us the same thing. So if we go into the report here and we go look at the Beacon Health report, it's gonna show us that same kind of information. So we open up this report, and it's, you can see we've got a bad battery here, bad battery there. This is that Ashland 2 that we looked at. The battery is bad. The solar array is good. And it's showing two lamp failures. And it's particularly bad that actually the communication isn't perfect because 4% of the time the device uh, battery is so low that it can't communicate back to glance. And a device down here where you've got a number of other bad batteries that they need to replace. So this is just a situation of they need to go out, and I believe they're supposed to be buying batteries for the system and replacing them, but they haven't gone out to do that. But you can see that the school beacons aren't going to work correctly on this system because we're telling you already that your batteries are bad. And you can see the voltages here are dropping down below 11 volts or sometimes 7 volts. And as soon as they drop below about 11 point four volts or 11.3 volts, depending on the LEDs and your uh, solar charging circuit, the beacons won't come on. 
So, you know, this is a great way of using all this data over here in this report to really give you insight on how your beacons are working and what you should do to um, solve some of these issues. The great thing with this is once you have the system deployed, and I use this as a sales tactic all the time, every single time I'm going to visit a city and before I go there, I open up this system, I look at the report, sometimes print it, and I have a conversation piece to say, hey, did you know that uh, your, your batteries are bad at this site? And generally they do because they've turned on their alarms and they've got an alarm saying bad battery at um, elementary Abington. So they know that they've got a bad battery there. One of the other things you'll be able to see with this as well is under the reports is the alarm activity. And these are all the current alarms that have occurred for the different businesses. And you can see here on this one, this is the, the one we looked at, which is Ashland 2, which is showing it sent us a bad battery alarm at 8.07 a.m. and the alarm hasn't closed, meaning the battery hasn't charged significantly enough that the, um, that the alarm has been cleared. So what they're going to have is, if you saw that battery, every day they're going to get an alarm going, bing, bing, Ashland number two, battery has failed. Bing, bing, battery number two every single morning because that's what's going to happen. Because what's happened is they haven't, you know, they haven't actually um, fixed that problem. So, you know, this is giving you a whole list of all the alarms that have failed. And here you can see this is when the, you know, they got a, a an alarm that one lamp had failed and then they had enough power that that uh, alarm cleared. And you can go back in time and see all of those kind of things. One of the other things you can see on the reports is the information on the school beacon event log. And this is when the people want to know, hey, what, what did my beacons do on this day? You click on this, opens up a tab here, you select, all right, I want to know what happened on November the 13th or... Barrett 3 school, and I hit filter. Now it's going to get all that data, and it's going to tell us over here that at 12.06 a.m. the beacon was off, and then it turned on at 7.55. It turned off at 8.35. It turned on at 3.06, and turned off at 3.36. Pretty simple, um, you know, just so they can track that. And then you can also look at the beacon schedule. So you can select on each of your different schools what schedule is in there. So we can go to Abington and there's their schedule, 7.35 on 8.15 off. So they can go and print this information if they want to. And here they can see, um, here they've got a funny schedule set up where they haven't selected July and August. So, you know, all of this information is here that people can look at the data and see what's happening on that. I'm going to slow down and stop and see if people have got questions for right now. Any questions? Anyone hear me still? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I wanted to make sure I wasn't talking for the last 45 minutes and no one heard me. <laughs> um, Jeff Smith, yes, I can say bird poo again. Uh. All right, I'm I'm trying to think if there's anything else that we should jump over. Um, the other type of beacon devices, I can go into 
a business over here being um, Fort Worth. And this is the city of Fort Worth where they have some dual beacons and driver feedback signs. Uh, these are the, the only other times that you've got to schedule some different things. Um, Leah, yes, the users can be logged in uh, in multiple browser windows. So, you, but you can only be logged in with one user. So that's why I I'm often you know, going in and opening up multiple different windows here um, so that you can go in and you can right click and you can open up, you know, more tabs so you can have more windows open uh, as much as you want. I find that very, very easy to use it. Uh, Bob, generally, I normally showcase... Um, City of Marietta uh, for um, showcasing features, uh, but it all depends on on who you're showcasing systems to. Uh, Marietta is normally our go-to business. Uh, that that seems to be a uh, business that you can that you can look at and demo pretty easily to everybody. Um, If we go in here, this is the only difference with a device with a driver feedback sign. You get median speed, 85th percentile speed, and, and volume of vehicles. And the only difference on scheduling for these devices is you can actually go in and you can look at, obviously, those graphs, but you've also got a tab over here for the radar information. And uh, I, I don't have publishing rights on this login <laughs> interesting i can't select any of the any of the tab information there because i'm not logged in with a um, with a person with, with a username and password that's capable of actually making edits normally you would see some uh, information over there on the speeds of what you would put up on 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 the actual vehicles oh in here Um, can you get data from the driver feedback signs, Brian? Yes. So all of the data is collected and stored. So I can actually go in and I can look at, uh, let me go to city of Marietta and all of the data is collected from those signs and stored on our servers. So here you can see they've got dedicated driver feedback signs here. And you can zoom into a device and you can select on a device um, and basically get the information from that device. So you can see there is the 85th percentile speed. You can click more details. You can export the data. Here's the median speed of that, of that uh, device, the 85th percentile, the volume and the what it currently is right now the 85th percentile 95th percentile the volume of vehicles it's not a very busy road it's 25 vehicles per hour on that roadway and the maximum over the last 24 hours of 54. you can go into more details and you can export all of this data but what we also do is we create uh, reports on this that will look at um all of the data for the whole month and because this is quite a big business we're going to go to marietta feedback signs and then we're going to look at the month of uh, november we'll select on one of these and this is now showing you for this device for the whole month of november so far this was the average speed for median speed, 8th percentile speed for that day. This is the detailed information on the median speed. And oh, my browser is uh, running a little slow here. 
these are the heat map information. So looking at where the speeds are fast and where the speeds are slow. So you can see this is 12. So it's a whole 25 hour period. You can see where people are speeding. Um, you can also see the 85th percentile speed. And that's going to give you all that information there. And my browser is running slow. This is the volume of vehicles along here. And this has been invaluable to a number of different people is to actually know what the volume is in a nice graphical view. Because some people thought that, hey, this road was busy at this time, but it wasn't. And this data is showing you, look here, th th this is busy on Monday to Friday, you know, during peak hour, and it starts from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. And there's no real evening peak on any of those days. There's a, only a morning peak along this roadmap. So it gives you a great idea that people are traveling in the morning out here, but they're not moving in the evenings. And you can see the, the weekends are quite slow. Uh, this is obviously Thanksgiving week here. So, you know, there weren't as many people working and everybody was back again on Monday. All the data is there. We integrate to three different suppliers at the moment, which is um, IDC <clears throat> and um, uh, IDC, Traffic Calm, and RU2. So those are the three different suppliers that we've integrated to. If there's anything else that, that anybody wants or wants to integrate to, we certainly can. It's just a question of, you know what? What do you want to? Um, what do you want to have access to? Does that make sense? I'm running about two more minutes. Any questions? Barring, I don't hear any. I want to thank everyone for their time. Um, I think next week we're going to be going over um, some functionality on preemption and that's going to go over looking at all the data for preemption vehicles, how you delve into all that data. And the following uh, session will be on connected vehicles, how to configure them, how to set it up, travel safely, what do we do on that? So, you know, a lot of the stuff that, when we come down in the field and we help sort of set up those map zones and things like that to give you guys the tools that you can all do it yourselves. So I want to thank everybody for joining on this session. Um, and thanks so much for giving all your time and we'll be um, jumping into the next one in two weeks time. Thank you, Peter. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thanks a lot.